Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ridge Chapel. It's so good to have you here with us this morning. We hope you're blessed by being together today and by listening to God's word as it's proclaimed this morning. I don't have any special announcements. Uh, I think they were about the same as they were last time, but I do want to remind the elders that we have a meeting now scheduled, and everybody have a meeting now scheduled the week before the board meeting every month. So February 1st, we have an elders meeting at 7 o'clock. Uh, you're welcome to come to that. And if you have anything that needs to go just to the elders, please make sure to uh, let us know about that so that we can discuss that at that elder, elders meeting. There are papers that are available from the annual report. Uh, those of you online, if you have not received those yet, uh, as well as your uh, annual giving report, uh, those are available. You can get them from, uh, uh, you can call somebody, Patty, somebody, <laughs> Uh, in order to be able to get that, or you can come to church and get it here. We'll try to mail it to you if uh, uh, you're not able to be here. Uh, just kind of a summary of last week's, because it wasn't online, unfortunately. I have to apologize again for that. The giving has increased, even in the case of COVID. Uh, missions giving was actually up 13,000. We were able to give 13,000 more to missions. God blessed us, and he used us to bless others. And if you put the missions, the special projects, and the benevolence all together, it's 51% of total income. So you can be uh, honored. God can be praised uh, for all that's accomplished uh, through the church here. Great is the Lord. Let's go ahead and begin our worship service today. Great is the Lord. He is holy and just. Great is the Lord. He is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory, great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice, great. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just, by his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy he proves he is love. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Amen. That's a good thing to sing and say every day, isn't that? Great are you, Lord. As we mentioned earlier, we're going to do an update on missions every month, and it'll just take one Sunday, a portion of one Sunday. Uh, this, this month is Eden Village. I hope you've been able to look at Facebook. I've been trying to post things on Facebook. Eden Village does very well with both Facebook and their uh, um, web, website as far as keeping us updated on what's going on. But there's a lot of recent things on there for you. But I wanted to just give you a quick overview. Uh, if We've been supporting Eden Village for quite some time. But besides the village, the residential home-based care for orphaned, abandoned, or endangered children. Right now there's 86 kids in full-time care. They're building house number nine and it's coming along very well. They also have a school, an intentional Christ-centered education for about 100 students. Several students this last year took their end of the year test in October, November, and December, both secondary and primary students. They have a clinic that serves tens of thousands of patients every year. It's free of charge and they are just uh, now getting a new staff nurse. The thing that they've been talking about right now because of uh, trying to raise funds in a special project is their farm. The farm at Eden provides staple foods, uh, vegetables, and meat for the entire Eden family. About 600 people's needs are met at an average cost of $1,330 per person per year. So their Feed the Village campaign was to raise $100,000. As of January 10th, they have $52,000, but that's the current fundraising project. There is a new project that they're just in the dreaming stages of now, but they believe God has given them a clear vision to build a five-part structure that will house what they call straight paths at Eden. 
Straight Paths represents an intentional disciple-making, church-planting movement within and through the village there at Doma over in Africa. They intend to bring people in, it says. I'll read a little bit more about it. En Gedi House, they call it. It'll include a central teaching worship hall for study and worship and prayer room for dedicated and disciplined prayer, as well as a communal kitchen and living area to share life together. Uh, they talk about people who have heard about Jesus but do not know him personally and are still entrenched in fear and deception. And so that's the whole purpose of that En Gedi House and their Straight Paths program to try to disciple the people in their area. They have some praises, a COVID-free 2020 for Eden and for most of Zimbabwe. Apparently, Zimbabwe has been doing fairly well. I already mentioned about the schools. They're open, uh, and uh, they're dealing with some of the educational re realities of having to shut down for a period of time. Uh, we have nine students that are nearing the completion of their education and preparing to move into transitional living as independent adults learning practical skills. Uh, they have a, a camp. It sounded kind of like CIY, Deep Empowering Visit to Lasting Impressions Camp for our eldest teenagers. They all come back knowing life is challenging and they should not expect grace because of their initial start in life that has been difficult. Uh, they give a name, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce it, Pauline N-C-U-B-E, N-Cube, I don't know, became Eden's first ever female university graduate first ever female university graduate. And we're very proud of her, they say. They do have to ask for prayer for ongoing providence from God. The operation of Eden has been very challenging with the realities of Zimbabwe's economy at the moment, and I think we've talked about that before. But they ask for us to pray for them and the nation as they navigate this challenging time. I'm excited to be the representative for Eden and Eden Village, and uh, all of the folks that have responsibilities over those missions. I hope that uh, uh, you'll listen uh, when we put stuff out or when we try to put it on Facebook and try to keep you updated on our missions. Uh, this is a missionary church, uh, but a lot of us uh, need to learn a little more about it, and that's why we're doing this. All right, as we prepare for communion this morning, uh, don't forget to have your emblems ready so that you might partake as we have the communion meditation. How great thou art. Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, When I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art.
it's interesting how some meditations prompt you to think of your own meditation. A couple months ago, David talked about singing in church. Uh, the part I don't remember is getting in trouble in church. No. So, um, but he talked about getting in trouble in church. I, I knew better than getting in trouble in church. But it did prompt me to think about singing in church. You know, he talked about the doxology, and that popped right in my head immediately, immediately because I'd sang it over and over and over again. And being a teacher and a coach, repetition is huge. One of my sayings is repetition penetrates the dullest of minds. And if you've ever taught somebody, you know sometimes those minds are fairly dull. <laughs> but the importance of singing in church was instilled by my mom and enforced by my dad. We were expected to sing every word, every verse, every chorus, every song, and all three services a week. We didn't get time off. As I've thought about that, after David's meditation, after the last several weeks, I've been thinking about that. And I think about how that's been put into me. The expectation of singing, but I had no idea where that was going. Many of you know I do wear a lot of hats. Early in the morning, I drive a bus. Leave it dark. Buzz through Flint Ridge. And there's moments while I get there on the bus, I get to sing in the bus. Sometimes I sing when the kids are on the bus. Sometimes I've sang late nights driving the bus home from a ball game. It's kind of fun, though, with the mask. They can't see your lips moving. So not that I'm trying to hide it, but it's, it's there. Those songs are in my heart. I've sang them wash, washing laundry on a Saturday morning after a football game. Psalms 89.1 states, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth will my make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you established your faithfulness in heavens itself. For me, singing has brought me in a closer relationship with God. As a teenage boy, dreaded every moment of it. But as an adult, knowing full well what those songs have done for me and for many others, it's given me a closer relationship with God. I, don't want, I want to encourage you today not just to sing in church, because that's the way I was when I was a young man. I just sang in church. But sing during your day. See how it changes your day in those bad moments, in those good moments, in those silent moments how it will change your heart and change your day. And I, then I really realized what Jesus was telling the woman at the well. Then you'll be able to worship God in spirit and in truth. Take the bread with me, please. Father, we are so grateful for an opportunity to worship you this morning. And we know that worship does not stop here. But we have the opportunity to continue to worship you uh, all the time any moment. And I pray right now that as we take this bread together, that you will bless us and remind us of your great love. Take the cup, please. Once again, Father, we are reminded of your love and the blood that was shed for each and every one of us, knowing full well that there was nothing we could do to deserve your love, but you loved us anyway. And just at the right time, you sent him for us and our sins. Help us to continue to live our lives in a way that we love you and that those around us know that we love you. In your son's name we pray, amen. One last thing, as I was getting ready for church today, I was reminded of a song I had not thought of in a long time. Make sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you, knowing Christ.
greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. I want to know you more. I want to know you more. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. I want to love you more. I want to love you more. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. I want to serve you more. I want to serve you more. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. Amen. I trust that you're all familiar with the story of Alice in Wonderland, where Alice falls down a hole and finds herself in a very strange place. As she wanders around, she comes to a fork in the road and meets the Cheshire Cat. Remember the story? Alice looks first one direction and then the other direction and then asks the Cheshire Cat, would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go? Well, that depends on where you want to get, answers the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. And then it doesn't matter, the cat answers, says, then it doesn't matter which way you go. Well, when it comes to planning for the future, for eternity, we live among people for the most part who don't know where they're going. In fact, many are so preoccupied with the here and now that they haven't bothered to give the future or at least their future, much thought. Now, how different is that from, well, previous generations, which sang, when the roll, or when the saints go marching in, oh Lord, I want to be in that number, when the saints go marching in. Now, in Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, Wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Well, I do want to find it and follow it. And I'm excited about the prospect of heaven. Now, how about you? I think you should be excited, too. While working on this sermon, <laughs> I began to consider different passages of Scripture where the Bible speaks about heaven. And there are many passages. My first thought was just use all of them and let the Bible testify in detail as to the wonders of heaven. But <laughs> it didn't take long to realize that at the time I gave that I have this morning, it wouldn't allow such detail. 
Then again, while God does give us many glimpses of heaven, they're only glimpses. And the reality will obviously be far more wonderful. In fact, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, the ninth verse, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So maybe the best thing for me to do this morning is just to take a few of the scriptures and point out some of the things about heaven that excite me the most, that make me look forward with anticipation, eagerness, and a determination that someday, too, I will hear my master say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, among many things that thrill me is the anticipation of seeing the beauty of heaven. Heaven will be far beyond any of my imaginations. I already stand in awe of the grandeur of this earth on which we live. I've seen the Grand Canyon. I've felt the mist of Niagara Falls. I've sailed on the Pacific Ocean and flown over the Atlantic and the Mediterranean and Aegean seas. I've lived among the snow-covered Himalayan mountains of China and Tibet, enjoyed the warmth and sunny days along the Gulf of Mexico. Yet I'm convinced that none of these really prepared me for the beauty of heaven that God has designed for those who love him. Now, a few years ago, a Christian songwriter named Keith Green, some of you have heard him, sang of God creating this beautiful earth in just six days. And then he said this, which I'll never, never forget. He asked, can you imagine what heaven will be like? He's been working on it for over 2,000 years. The Apostle John exhausts our ability to understand as he describes what he saw of heaven in the book of Revelation. What, now, remember... He's using descriptions and words that we can understand to describe something that we really can't understand. He uses his best ability. So he speaks about streets of gold, gates of pearl, foundations of precious stones, and a rainbow-circled throne. But even more wonderful in Revelation found in Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And then he continues on. There's so much more in that chapter alone. But look down at the 11th verse. He says, It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel. And then going on in the 23rd verse, The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light. Now, the last verse 
of the song. Amazing grace. We sing it a lot. says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. The beauty of what God has prepared for those who love him. But really, what I look forward the most will be seeing my Savior face to face, to meet him, to worship him, to bask in the warmth of his presence and his love, and to think, not only will I see Jesus, I'll be able to walk and talk with heroes of the faith who have gone on before. Now, this is just part of my list. Noah. Oh, what it'd be like to talk to Noah. And Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, and Elijah, and Isaiah, Daniel, Queen Esther, Peter, and John, and Stephen, and Paul. And then Polycarp, Justin Martyr, Martin Luther, William Carey, Adoniram Judson, the first missionary to China, and David Livingston. I mean, just to name a few. There's so many. Well, all right, I won't go. I could go on and on with those that I would really like to meet and ask them questions and let them tell me stories. And yes, how wonderful it would be when I see my father and my mother and my grandfather once again. And I meet my other grandparents that I, whom I never knew. Heaven will be heaven to me just because of those whom I will meet there. But sadly, the Bible says not everyone will be there. In fact, Jesus said, if you remember, wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now, nowadays, many people have bought into the notion, it's a popular one, that everybody is going to heaven. Have you heard this? It doesn't matter what you believe, we're all heading for the same place. While this notion may be comforting, it's not the truth. If we don't have a personal relationship with Christ here, we can't expect a more and new and eternal relationship with him in heaven. So love should compel us to tell about Jesus, about his wonderful love. Can you imagine what it would be like to be reunited with your loved ones? To sit together at the feet of Jesus? Oh, that will be heaven to me. And I look forward to it. Now, it seems that almost every day, I'm becoming more and more eager for some of the benefits of heaven. No more pain. No more falling. I've, uh, I've, I'm experiencing that more and more nowadays. No more blurred vision. Oh, on, on I could go. All that's mentioned in the 21st chapter of Revelation. But the Apostle Paul assures us that Christians will have a new and glorified body. Here's Philippians, the third chapter, verses 20 and 21. 
but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Now, after he arose from the tomb, my Lord's body was no longer subject to heat and cold and hunger and pain. It was no longer bound by this, well, the restrictions of earth. And someday, my body will be like his. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and 53, tells us, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. Now, Charles Fuller, some of you know that name. He was the founder of Fuller Theological Seminary in California. And he was preacher for many years on the old-fashioned revival hour radio program. Well, once he announced that he would be speaking the next Sunday on heaven, and that during that week, he received a touching letter from an old man who was very ill. I want to read just a part of that letter to you. I have heard that next Sunday you are to talk about heaven. I am interested in that subject because I have held a title to a bit of property there for over 55 years. I did not buy it. It was given to me without money and without price, but the donor purchased it for me at a tremendous sacrifice. It's not a vacant lot. For more than half a century, I have been sending materials out of which the greatest architect and builder of the universe has been building a home for me. Termites can never undermine its foundation, for it rests on the rock of ages. Fire cannot destroy it. Floods cannot wash it away. No locks or bolts will ever be placed upon its doors, for no vicious person can ever enter that land where my dwelling stands. It is now almost completed and ready for me to enter and abide eternally. I hope to hear your sermon on heaven next Sunday from my home in Los Angeles. But I have no assurance that I shall be able to do so. My ticket to heaven has no date marked on it for the journey. Yes, I'm all ready to go, and I may not be here while you're talking next Sunday, but I shall meet you there someday. I like that letter. As Christians, we have the responsibility to tell people of the benefits of heaven. Regardless of adversity or ridicule that we might receive in trying to reach the unbeliever, we must keep pointing the way to heaven. A father was walking past his son's bedroom late one night, and he heard his young son's voice saying over and over again, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. Startled, the father stepped into the room and asked, Why are you saying that? The boy explained, I have been reading this wild western, 
and the villain always seems to be getting the best of the hero. So I finally skipped to the end of the book and read the last chapter. Now, whenever the villain seems to be winning, I just laugh and say, you're going to get it. Well, I think that boy is right. If you know the end of the story, then you're not overly bothered by all the twists and turns of the plot. And like that little boy, I already know the end of the story. I know that Jesus has won the victory over sin and death, and he is my Savior and my Lord. Someday, and maybe sooner than I now realize, my life upon this earth will be over. And when the saints go marching in, I'll be in that number. I want to be in heaven and see my Savior face to face. And my, my father and my mother. And once again to meet many others who through the years have been a part of my life. And yes, I want to see you there, too. Don't you want to be in that number when the saints go marching in? Maybe it's my age or my health or whatever it might be. This subject gets to be more and more attractive to me all the time. I have all kinds of questions I want to ask different people. Some of the heroes of the faith that I mentioned earlier. And then there are some things I want to ask my grandfather because I can remember him telling me about some things. I wish I had listened and heard better. I, my grandfather told me about two of his uncles that fought, well, three of his uncles that fought in the Civil War. And one of them fought for one side, talking about two of them, and one fought for the other side. Well, really, one fought for one side, and one fought for both sides. And uh, when I asked him about that, he said, well, he was captured, and given the choice, switch sides or die. So he switched sides. <laughs> now, I never did ask him about, well, which side, which side. I didn't ask him. But my uh, grandfather was part Cherokee. And I'm beginning to wonder if maybe that was one of his Cherokee ancestors who very frankly didn't care whether the North or the South won, as long as he stayed alive. I don't know. There's a lot of questions I want to ask. Maybe I'll be so busy, I won't even think of those. But oh, heaven. Well, everybody wants to go there. But not everybody is accepting the one who has the opening, the pass, the doorway into eternity with him. If Jesus is not yet your Savior, your Lord, Oh, he makes it so simple to simply say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. What does the word Christ mean? What's the translation of the Jewish word Messiah? Well, what does that mean? The promised one who came to forgive our sins. And oh, I've got a lot that I need forgiven, which I have been forgiven. And I'm afraid I'll probably do some things yet ahead that will need to be forgiven too. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. But I have a Savior who will forgive my sins. And I want to be with him for eternity. How about you? 
If Jesus is not yet your Savior, would you accept him today, his love? Would you follow his example in baptism? Would you rise to walk in a new relationship, a new life? So that one day you might have a new body for all eternity. Or if you're already a Christian and you need a church home, a place where you feel like, well, here's where I can serve, we invite you to make this congregation your place of service as a Christian. Would you come as we stand, as we sing? be seated. This concludes today's worship service. Thank you for listening. We hope you were encouraged by joining us on Facebook Live. Please message us if you have questions or would like more information. May God bless you and give you his peace.